You, well, let me you, ask you a question. Let me just ask you a question. Okay, fine. Have you ever been restricted by a non-compete? Yes, I currently have it. I've I've had two non-competes in my entire life. One when we have sold, you ever, one when we sorry, sold Thinkorswim and one when we sold Tasty. And has anybody ever invoked the non-compete clause and used it to prevent you from taking actions? No. Are no. you going to ask me the same question now? Um, sure. Have you ever been um, held back by a non-compete? Yes. Really? Tell me. Oh, yeah. So when I left CNBC... Yeah. So see, the NBC contracts all have non-competes. Yeah. So that a TV host can't go from NBC to Fox or from Fox to CBS yeah. without either six months. It depends on the negotiation, I'm sure. Okay. With the, I would say the shortest is six months and the longest is a year or even a year and a half. I'm okay. sure like for Tom Brokaw, they probably had an 18-month cooling off period or something. Okay, so Tom that's fine. To CBS, right? Yeah. So when I left CNBC and was hired at MSNBC which is technically two divisions of the same corporation because it was all owned by Comcast. Yeah. But I would, my contract was not with Comcast. My contract was with CNBC, which is a subsidiary thereof. And my new contract was not with Comcast. It was with MSNBC, which is a different subsidiary thereof. CNBC invoked section 42-4-3474122764732 on page 943 which states that thou shalt not broadcast for any other entity enterprise organization or affiliation and so CNBC actually invoked the non-compete because at that point I had a very hot hand at Fast Money. I was a, I had, in the sense that I had a big audience. So the show was very popular, the financial crisis, so the ratings were off the charts. And so CNBC deliberately invoked and used the non-compete to force me off the air in a, because the head of MSNBC and the head of CNBC hated each other. And so the, when the head of MSNBC hired me, after I resigned from CNBC, that was already like a screwed up thing to do in the sense that like, you know, he's like, this guy should never work at this organization ever again, meaning the parent company. And then the guy from the other division gives me the best job of my life, money, whatever things. So then the first guy, the CNBC guy, invokes section 4737421276473742222 on page 943 in order to obviously prevent me from having, keep bringing the audience from CNBC to MSNBC and to prevent the MSNBC executive from harvesting the CNBC audience over to the MSNBC audience, even though all the money's going to the same bank account in Philadelphia, by the way, at Comcast was kind of a screwed up thing. Um, but I was in a non-compete, the non-compete was invoked. And it was, now I think that there's a probably, it must've been a six month, you know, a garden leave, you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, but I do believe if memory serves that the CEO of MSNBC went to the CEO of Comcast after two months or something and sort of made his best case for why this is against Comcast's interests. And then they waived section 4737421277643222 on page 943 after three months instead of six months. So I feel very, I feel like I have a lot of domain expertise, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, and I think they're a good thing. And I think they're a good thing. You think what's a good thing? Non-competes. I think non-competes are a necessary way to protect the equity. Of, so in other words, so I, I would not have had a big audience and, and, and everybody knows my name and I can get these big million dollar salaries at the time and all those things. If CNBC had not spent years sticking my beak in everybody's face, and, you know, spending their giving me producers and giving me things and things and things. And so I wouldn't have been in a position to command this new fabulous, you know, financial contract and job if I had not had the investment of the initial employer. Now, it was stupid in this sense because it was in corporate invite. Yeah, yeah. I, and, but another, okay, so if Microsoft or, or Google or whoever yeah. invests 
all, all their expertise, all their support, yeah, access sure. to their resources. That that that's an equity investment that makes you, Tom Sosnoff, the 24 year old, more valuable than you would otherwise be. And they're protecting their investment because if I'm investing all the training, all the resources, I mean, I think about the training they put into us at Bloomberg when I was 22, a lot of money was spent on paying trainers and paying. I mean, I'm sure, you know, you, you're very familiar with the costs of educating and training new hires and all these things. Sure, of course. And so, and so it's a way to protect companies. Protect what? Protect companies' investment in training talent so that they don't How, how are you protecting they, the company's investment? Because I'm preventing young Tom. How's that protecting the company's investment? All you're doing is you're not protecting the company. That's all bullshit. Yeah, I am. I'm keeping Tom from ripping me off. No, you're not keeping Tom from ripping you off either. You're not protecting anything. You're not keeping me from ripping off. It, that's that's total garbage, and you know it. That's not what that is. That is no, that's strictly exactly what that is. No, it is not. It's strictly just it's my ball, and you can't use it. And what you're saying is essentially that that this is almost like it's a penalty clause, but you're not protecting anything. Like here, there's a reason why we've never asked anybody to sign a non-compete ever in 40 years of running my own business. Never asked anybody to sign a non-compete. You don't wanna know why? Why? Because if you don't want to be here, I don't want you. I don't care what the hell you do next. Okay, okay, so can I can I address this? Can yeah, I speak to sure. this? Sure, go ahead, address it. Because I've had sort of two huge corporate adventures right 10 years at bloomberg and then 10 years at nbc okay of, yeah sure these, i just gave you the nbc's culture right which is heavy i, on I don't care i'm i'm not i i understand I'm what, what trying, cnbc I'm does i don't make care a point. i'm trying to make a i'm trying to make a point here okay at bloomberg there were no non-competes of course michael bloomberg agrees with tom sosno yeah of course and, and he says you know what if you don't want to be here get the f out that's in right in fact in fact at bloomberg the whole these places where they're like, oh, two weeks notice, and oh, it's Tom's last day, and let's have a party. No, Tom quits. He has thirty minutes. A hundred percent agree. From the You're moment he quits to get the f out of the building, one. Yeah. Two. He can never work here again. You will never. It's like you, there, you can't come back in five years and be like, oh, you know, hey, no, no. You want to stay here? You stay here. You don't okay. want to be here? Get out right I, now. I. I did not know that about Michael Bloomberg, and we have the same exact policy. The day you tell us, like people have come into us and say, listen, I'm going to give my two weeks notice. And we're like, nope, you're out now. Just walk out. Don't come back. Exactly. Yeah, we don't. It was, it was legendary because there was a guy who was one of the equity co-founders, like yeah, the sure. original head of sales. Get out. He was the biggest of the big in terms of not being Mike Bloomberg, yeah. you know, whatever. And everybody walked into the office one day. I don't remember his name. But he walked in and they're like, oh, where's Tom? You know, whoever, like Mr. Big. And they're like, yo, he quit. And and you're like, and, and everyone's like, you mean Mike told him? Like, who had been with him, you know, for 430, forever, from day one kind of a thing. 30 minutes, get out. Yeah, we, we have the exact same policy. So and would you do the same? Would you throw Scott out in 30 minutes if you could? Oh, in a heartbeat. No, no. I mean, you know, listen, he's my partner. That's a little different. But no, it's different. I we, know. We have, we have been that way. Him and I have been united on that front for for the last, you know, thirty eight years or whatever, however long we've been together. Yeah. And and once you leave, you can never come back. And once you, um, uh, I shouldn't say it. There's been a couple of exceptions over the years. And but, there were a couple of exceptions at Bloomberg as well. Yeah, by the way. I mean, but are, generally speaking, once you leave, you can't come back. A couple of exceptions. And then, and then, but when you leave, you just, you're gone. Walk out right now. Right. And so, we never so, asked so, anybody. So, so I would say there's two competing schools of thought, which are represented by the Sosnoff Bloomberg School, which is if you're here, no one's going to take better care of you than I will. And you're going to work your ass off for me. And yeah. I love you. Yeah. And if you don't want to be here, get out right now. If you don't want to be here, I don't, I'm not going to, if you're not going to, if you think you have a better opportunity somewhere else, go there. And if you don't want to be here, go there. I don't care. I'm not, I, I hate firms. But if, I, but, if, but, if, but, if, but if, okay. So, but if I am the best baseball player in the world, yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to get into sports because it's that, that contract where it's too crazy. Okay. But if I am Tom Broca or I am the head of healthcare investment banking at Goldman Sachs, and I want to take my entire client list and all you know hundreds of millions of dollars in fee income from Goldman Sachs to Morgan Stanley. 
or if I'm Tom Brokaw or whatever, whoever, Lester, or whoever the boss is, whatever, or the anchorman is, and I'm going to go from NBC to ABC, you don't think a non-compete is appropriate in those situa- in some, in those types of situations I don't where think it's a an economic asset? I don't think a non-compete is ever appropriate, ever. And and I also think that the that non-competes are actually, first of all, why does anybody want somebody working with them that doesn't want to work there? And but again, that, there's, I'm not saying you have to work here. I'm saying you can't take my investment in you and go. I can't. You can't take your tasty trade expertise over to Robinhood, and why not sell it there? Why not? Because tasty trade has taught you everything you know about so online brokerage. So somebody taught and now you're going to go sell it to someone else, you little bastard. Everybody lost. Everybody learned something somewhere else. And where do you draw the line? I'm pumping gas at mobile. I can't I can't go, you know, across the street to Sunoco because I have some certain skill that I could stop it right when you say five dollars, I stop it right in the number. I mean, like, where are you gonna draw the line? I'm making a sandwich. Maybe, Maybe I am. Maybe I am. Yeah. If you're cutting locks at Rust and Daughters, I can't cut locks at Zabars because I have a non-compete. I mean, come on. Because you think some somebody's really are you that much more special because you can answer a telephone different or you can code put a line of code down? Give me a break. But there is a spectrum between that and No, there's not. An extreme No, th- you said you have a non-compete right now. I I the, the 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 You're under a non-compete as you speak. Yeah, I not because I wanted it, just because it's the only way they do they operate their deals, you know. Yeah, that's what they all that's what everybody you think anybody wants a non-compete? You think anybody walks in there like I would like a raise, I'd like four. Yeah, but I I, I mean dollars. sometimes you have no I would like a non-compete. You ask me what I I mean, if this if the if the if the choice is mine. I don't, you know, when, and it is when somebody comes. Well, my point is the motivation in your instance for the non-compete is because you're seen as extremely valuable by them. And they don't want you to go and do, do what you do for them for someone else. Yeah, sure. But it's it's probably not enforceable. Yeah, it, it probably isn't. But your point is even at the at the extreme talent level for a Tom Sosnoff or for a professional athlete or for the head of invest the head of an investment banking division or a huge you know, a TV host of doesn't matter. whatever that doesn't matter. That Every, all of them should be outlawed. They're all ridiculous. Every single one. Yeah. And again, remind your logic once again. My logic is that that nobody, you know, listen, when when you when you hire somebody to do something, the expectation is that they'll do what you hired them to do. There's not a lifelong obligation that you can never do it somewhere else. It's ridiculous. That's what you do. Like the whole idea of a non-compete is, okay, so so I'll get Tom Sosnoff to sign a non-compete so he doesn't go somewhere else to compete with us or to open another business. But that's this is what I do. So if 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 I don't want to work here or if I don't want to work here or you don't want me to work here, this is what I do. I don't have another skill set. This is my thing. You know, I don't want to do another kind of business. Like, why should somebody that this is their business, this is their skill set, be forced to do something else? It's ridiculous. That's why. So why do you, why does but, anybody... But the company is investing resources in Europe. Like, if you, if you don't, if the pump company is giving you large amounts of money devoting much more in the way of resources than it is in giving you money. And really, do you think, do you think, do you always think that that's the way it is? I think that I make the company way more money than they make me or that they pay me. So in that sense, I think that the, the, the scale is weighted towards them like 50 to one. So it's, I think it's the completely other way around. I don't think they would have an argument in court. And I think a lot of people are like that. I think a lot of people that have signed non-competes, whether you make $50,000 a year or $500,000 a year, add way more value than their $50,000 or their $500,000. And therefore, I think it's it's swayed the other way. And so the company gets the non-compete on top of the fact that they're making some multiple of what they're paying you. Listen, I, I, I this is an argument. This this is and, and how is this even? And, and, and my other concern with this whole situation is this is a private commercial contract between employers and individuals. 
Sure. You no one's forcing you to sign. Yeah, yeah, you are. If you want it, if you want the job or you want the sale, don't take the job. Then don't take the job. You don't need to take another job. Like, what's the government doing? Getting involved. Well, the problem, the problem with it is that there's only, you know, of of all the companies in the financial service business that I know of, Tasty is the only one that where we where we don't we don't ask you. Every other one does. So if you want to be in financial service, what are you going to do? You can't you can't dictate those terms. So and most Meaning of the, that, that it's not fair to you're saying criticism calling it just a a private contract is disingenuous. Yeah, of course, leverage, of course, and and the, the person leverage for the employer. And the person that's hiring, let's say you go, let's say you want to get a job with J.P. Morgan, for example. They've got two hundred and fifty thousand employees. They're not going to change. If you said, "Hey, I'm not signing this," they're going to be like, "Hey, find another job." Yeah, I mean, we got two hundred fifty thousand employees that signed. So you're this. basically saying that it's collusion. So, in other words, the fact that the FDC. I'm not which is basically dealing- saying it's collusion. It is collusion. It's un- it's universal and it's industry wide, and in in many cases, it's much bigger than industry wide. And yes. It, and, and that's why they're getting rid of it. There's a good reason for getting rid of it. It's wrong. I, you know, it's obviously not wrong because it, 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 you're assigning no value to the investment that's being made by the organizations. That's right. In, that's right. In, in these individuals. Because do you know why companies hire people in general? The reason that you hire somebody is because you are going to make some multiple on that person. That's the reason you hire somebody. You don't hire, like, we just don't indiscriminately hire. We hire somebody because if we pay them X, we're going to make three times X in revenue on that from that person, okay? So you're getting paid for it. It's not like you're not getting paid. So you're training that person and you are getting paid for it. If that person decides to leave, you replace them with somebody else of which you make three times X on. Otherwise, you're not in business anymore. So the idea that you're giving them something, no, they're not. You, they're giving you something. Meaning that I'm selling you my labor at a discount to its value to your organization by definition. You are not selling it at a discount. You are selling it at fair value. But the company is able to take that fair value and turn it into a profit center. And therefore, if you're not there, they replace you with somebody else and they do the same exact thing. And the and the training process is part of their cost of just doing business. It's already built into your salary. And it's ridiculous when they say, oh, my God, we took you and you're taking our industry secrets and all that stuff. It's all bullshit, garbage, complete garbage. Well, not to mention, I would not to not to to take not to advocate anything on your side, but there are there's you don't need a non-compete. Like if I work at Google and I take a bunch of proprietary intellectual property from Google and I go over and take it to Microsoft. A non com I don't need a non compete for legal recourse. I can. There are tr- laws around trade secrets and intellectual property. Of course, you can't steal. Can be enforced. Like if yeah. I take the design of the back end of Tasty, of course, and I and I sell it to Robinhood. Of course, you don't need a non compete to come after. No, me, no, no. Right? That is that is something completely different. You're right. You're right. But we've had situations. How do you, how do you, we've had situations right. where we've tried to hire somebody from a trade desk of another firm to come to work at a trade desk of ours. You know, I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? You're going to try to stop this kid from coming over here because, because, because you paid for their registration of their licenses. Give me a break. Go sue the kid if you want. And we'll back them. You know, like, and I like when, I love when companies, when companies tell you, because this happens to us all the time, because we'll hire people that have non-competes, you know, other companies, because we don't believe in them. And people, and other firms will, you know, their their chief legal team or their compliance we'll send officer. Send a big letter, big, and, big, fat or, letter. Or their CEO will call up. I've had CEOs call me up and say, hey, Tom, you you better not take this person or we're going to come after you guys. I mean, you're, I go. Section 944372747. But, but I'm always saying the same thing. I go, you're going to come after us for what? I don't have a deal with you. <laughs> so you're going to tell me who I can and can't hire? And, and, they, and they would say, well, you can't hire this person because we have a non-compete with them. And I go, you have a non-compete with them. I don't have anything with you. And if you want to go after them, go after them. And whether or not I decide to pay their legal expense, whatever, but you're going to look like an idiot. And they never, ever, ever, ever go after them, ever. So how do you reconcile your advocacy for the FTC's government overreach to intervene, to intervene or government? I won't call it that's That create, ex- exhibits prejudice on my part. How do you... I was going to object to that, your, counselor, but instead, I know I, I apologize. I, yeah. I, I, I self objected. Um, how do you reconcile your alignment with the FTC's 
intervention on the perceived collusion regarding non-competes with your resistance to the FTC intervening in the obvious monopolies of the giant tech companies. Huh, I don't know. Like, what, the, what? Like, the, like, like, like the most obvious monopoly, I would say, I'll take this, the most, the, the layup of all the monopolies, right? Because you can debate Amazon or Google or whatever. Sure. But for sure, the Apple App Store is the close, is, is the purest, you know, the least debatable example of a um, tech monopoly, where if you want to get your app into the system, the only way you can do it is to get it into okay. the Apple App Store. All right, sure. And they and they pound you on the price. Oh, okay, so what's your point? What's your question? And and but and so you're and so you're okay with the FTC stepping in to powder the non-competes, but you don't recommend that the FTC step in and pow powder the the fee structure at the App Store. What do you mean? I don't. Why, why would you? I'm even saying say every that? time I bring up using the FTC to address the tech monopolies, you're like, oh, leave them be. The market. No, 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 no. There's a big difference between tech monopolies and certain things that they offer. I am, I am a huge, um, I'm in huge opposition, and I was very supportive of um, what was the company that was going after the App Store, um, not Take Two. The video but, game company, I think. Yeah, the video game company, but not Take Two, the other one. Um, Activision? Yeah, Act Activision, right. No. Was it? I don't know if it was. It was, I, think, I feel like they started with an E. It was, it was like the, a, whoever did World of Warcraft. So whoever the company was, a big was, video game company. Yeah, the company behind World of Warcraft. Anyway, and sure, I was a huge supporter of them going after Apple. The Apple, I, the Apple, you know, App Store is ridiculous. It drives me crazy. But that's, you know, those that's apples and oranges. No, I am not in favor of protecting the Apple, you know, iStore. You call it monopoly. I just, you know, whatever it is. Um, but I am in favor of allowing tech companies to get bigger. To do their thing but, but uh, you say that but it's you know clear that amazon for instance has been has in, exerts a lot of leverage because of its size relative to of course every they do. other region but 25 years ago amazon didn't even exist so my point is that we need disruptors in the world of technology and the stuff you know we can look at amazon and if you take a few steps back is the world a better place this is what drives me crazy about the argument you're making. Is the world a much, much better place with Amazon or without Amazon? Or would it be without Amazon? Better for, better for who? Better for who? Better for you, Dylan Radigan, the consumer. Better for you, Dylan Radigan, the entrepreneur. The technology, you know, the technology. Definitely not. Every single thing that we do, we're all better off for Amazon being around. Couldn't disagree more. Oh, my God. How, do you, how can you even say that? Because the lack of differentiation from small stores offering unique artisanal products from one village. Okay, so you're mad at you. So, so you hate Walmart too and everything else. Yeah. Okay. For sure. That's fine. So you want to live in the world where we go back to like you know beautiful little streets with lots of boutiques on it, and you know you yeah, go shopping for your you That's go right. shopping for your food on a daily basis. You pick up your fresh bread That's and right. your, everything else. And now that I stop at the cheese store, yeah, of course you I do. Stop yeah, at the bread yeah. store. Yeah, I'll I'll you send you that? I'll send you a list of countries that you can move to. And cities in those countries that that will that will support that lifestyle, you know, and and even those places in like Italy and other places like that that have that still have they they hate the tourists there that support that economy. That's how dumbass people are. Yeah, no, I'm not buying this whole argument. Don't give me that crap. No. So speaking of monopolies, since it's a sort of recurring side theme of this podcast and the world we live in. It also appears that I won't say it's a monopoly, but that there's an increasing concentration of the total enterprise value of all of the equity stock in the world that is held in private as opposed to available in the public markets. I, I don't know if it was The Economist. There's somebody had a big article recently talking about how the, re the relative percentage of total equity that is held in the hands of private equity as opposed to the public equity markets is increasing to the point where the re the actual net percentage of all equity that's held privately relative to that which is held publicly has um, shifted in favor of private holding. 
that would seem to be a move away from the democratization of finance to the availability for the av average Joe and Jane to participate in the long-term value of equity, positive drift and appreciation in favor of the extremely wealthy who are the only ones who are in owners of private equity firms, increasingly hold holding a disproportionate, disproportionate percentage of the overall equity appreciation in the world at the expense of the little guy. So it's an advantage for the super rich over everyone else. And at the same time, it narrows the available pool of equity in general in the public markets, making them less dynamic, less interesting, and on the margin, more fragile. Very interesting argument. And your, and your argument is that the reason that this is happening is because of what? Because public being a publicly traded company is burdensome, expensive, and a royal pain in the ass. Quarterly earnings, Sarbanes-Oxley, a bajillion dollars a year in legal fees, a bajillion dollars a year in administrative fees. Who needs it? And you're right. And so who are you mad at? The government. The like gov everybody. Yeah. Okay. So you really should I'm not be mad at anybody. I just believe that the government has made the costs of being a public company so burdensome that it's created a massive. So, so, so you're not equity. mad at the private equity firms and you're not mad not. at the companies in themselves, right? Because you can't. No, no one is mad here. OK, OK. So here's the problem. It's not really the government. All right. The government had. The regulators had very little choice after oh, wait. Post, post all the abuses of you know 08 and prior to 08. So so their 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 hands were tied in that they had to do something. And you know, companies, financial service companies among the worst offenders, um, you know, put the economy on the brink because they were unethical and they should have been given the death penalty or a version of the death penalty. They should have been put in jail for a long time, meaning the Ooh. corporate jail, corporate jail, the, 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 the financial service companies that abused the system and put the system the on the brink. That, that exploited the too big to fail. Thing. The it's, banks, it's the safe. banks, banks, brokerages, everybody that exploited it, lenders, everybody. Now, in, in response to that, the government had to do something. So the regulators stepped up and did what they had to do, which was put things in place to protect the integrity of the system. So we can't blame the government for this. Okay. This was not well, we can we we can most assuredly blame no, the government. No, this is no, this is if you want to blame somebody, you can blame the financial service world because can't blame the private equity firms, can't blame the companies themselves. Okay, but the structure that we had created, which is an exchange structure and which is a um, whatever you want to call the financial service distribution structure, essentially, you know, the whole um, uh, the whole the whole the whole way we bring companies public and the whole corporate finance structure. That's You're saying where, that the, the, the fee structure and the friction of going public and operating publicly is exactly is, the, is the, the, that the friction of the transition from private to public is so 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 brutal. The pressure on financial service companies to to beat their earnings and the fees that they charge these companies to go public that we put ourselves in a position where the financial service companies were ripping off the individual companies, the exchanges were ripping off these individual companies, and then ultimately the consumer got ripped off because everything fell down to the consumer. And the companies that should have been punished and essentially put in corporate jail for this were walked away because they were supposedly too big to fail. And part of that, it was systemic. There was nothing, you know, I'm not sure what we could do except fix the system. The world of private equity, see, private equity needs the public marketplace. Let's be fair about private equity for a second. There's no such thing. Private equity doesn't exist without an exit, right? You need an exit. 
You can't have private equity without an exit. And every company cannot be bought and sold privately. It just doesn't work that way. So the only way to get an exit is to take a company out into the public market space. And so every private equity firm wants a public response or a public event somewhere down the line, three years, five years, seven years, nine years, whatever it is. They want a public response. Now, to me, that's that whole thing is really fascinating because the same group that that needs, you know, the same group that needs those public events didn't do enough to protect the integrity of those events. They didn't really understand it. Now I think they do. And now I think the world has changed. Now I think that there's not something necessarily broken, except that we have to get companies that are willing again to go back to the public marketplace by reducing the fees so, and the overhead uh, so costs. So let's talk about, all right, because so I, I, as you know, I'm on, I'm on the board of a hospitality company that approached an IPO on the NASDAQ a couple of years ago, backed away. The COVID thing was no friend of a hospitality, of a travel company at the time, and mm -hmm. is reapproaching that now a second time, albeit no longer in an American market, but in a, in a non-American market, meaning a different, like a public market in London versus New York. What became apparent to me in that process was the obscenity of the fees, whether it was the legal fees or the banking fees, or the accounting firm fees, by the way, the accounting firms make out like a bandit yeah. to certify. I mean, it's the madness. They just, the, you know, I can spend many millions of dollars just with an accounting firm. To oh, yeah. The books. yeah. In, in, a, in a weekend, I can spend $7 million if you're not paying attention. The reason the fees are so high, whether it's legal accounting or investment banking, is because of a collusion between the big accounting firms, KPMG, blah, blah, the big law firms, and the big investment banks. Okay, so I, don't, you, I, don't, you, you, I don't disagree. So, so my, my point is that that's another place for Linda Kahn. In other words, the, the, nothing, the reason, so you have a conflict of interest, right? Where it's in the interest of private equity to have it to be cheap to go public, because they'd love to get the, lower the fees to get their private company public. It's in the interest of any private company owner to have the fees to go public get lower. The only person who has an incentive to charge high fees to transition from public to private is those who control the, the doorway, right? The gatekeepers, lawyers, accountants, and bankers. There's a small enough number of lawyers, bankers, and accountants that they can get away with seven and eight figure um, fees, service fees, to facilitate these transactions only because of the collusion between them. In other words, you have, would you have the FTC step in and a target the fees for equity transactions from the public private markets into the public markets? Because I can tell you, and I'm sure you already know this, but I'll just remind you that the fees to go public in New York have to be 10 times, if not more, 20 times more than the fees to go public in London. For instance, um, yeah, that's probably well. I don't know if it's ten times, but it's pretty significant. A lot more. But the opportunity is more. It's all based on opportunity cost. Would you have the FTC target the same way that they've now targeted real estate brokers on their six percent vig for the first time in the last year? Would you think, have the government target the seven percent IPO fee or the you know the 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 accounting and legal fees, which quickly become five and ten million dollars? I think that the exchanges, U.S. exchanges and U.S. Um, financial service companies that bring um, that sponsor you know that do basically that underwrite all the corporate debt and corporate. Um, uh, IPOs and stock, you know, listings need need um, some regulatory boundaries, and I think that's an absolute no brainer. And I think if you did that, you would clean up the marketplace and bring a lot more companies public. Because if companies could could actually figure out what their costs will be and what they will actually net out, they would be much more inclined to take to go public than they would be to stay. You know, one of the reasons that people love SPACs, even though they didn't work, 
um, was because it was so much easier a process to take a company public. You didn't essentially need a brokerage firm. You didn't need a financial service firm. That's why SPACs were so popular. That's why so many companies came out. I mean, there, we needed to learn a lesson from the entire SPAC mm -hmm. debacle. The bad part about SPACs was way too many companies came out and went public that shouldn't have because they saw the opportunity without the costs. But we didn't learn the lesson that that's, the, that's what drove all those companies to the marketplace. We can do that easily in a regulated marketplace, and that's how it should be done. The SPAC experiment didn't work because there was there was um, uh, because nobody anticipated the amount of companies that were going to come out that way. But they didn't. Re it didn't require the the normal funding and the normal kind of like pipeline to getting capital. So it worked. So I, I think that the the SPAC experiment was huge to show that the demand is actually there. The system, the way it exists today, is broken. How would you fix it? If the SPAC was up, the SPAC was obviously it's just, it's just it's, the desire for a solution, but it was a, not a. It's a regulatory thing. It's easy. Hey, you know what? We're only gonna we're only gonna you you can only charge X amount um, to bring a company public. You know, you can only charge X amount. The exchanges can only get so much, and the the underwriters can only get so much. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah, Goldman Sachs wouldn't be happy, but the smaller underwriters would be fine. And Goldman Sachs doesn't do shit anyway. They don't sit there and protect the stock price. They don't sit there and do anything that anybody else couldn't do. Same with Morgan Goldman Stanley. Sachs Same only with, brings the best companies public. No, they bring the, they don't, that's all garbage. They don't bring the best companies public. They bring the only companies that can afford to pay them public. Goldman Sachs never asks the question, what does your company do? Goldman Sachs and, and Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan, they only ask, here's the amount of money we're going to charge. Can you pay this? They don't care what you do. It's the biggest bunch of crap ever. They never ask. They never ask once. What do you do? I don't know. I talked to my friends at Goldman Sachs. They say they only bring the best companies public. No, I, they, I, I, that I, is garbage. They only bring the companies that can afford to pay them public. Trust me. If you could not afford to pay Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs is taking telling you to go jump in a lake. <laughs> They're not running a charity. Hey, hey, I'm gonna tell you a quick story, and then we can end this segment today. But it's one of my kind of going back in the way back machine. But when we were building Thinkorswim, we needed a place to clear. And we had really good connections at Bear Stearns because we had f connections from the floor. So we went to Bear Stearns and we said, we'd love to clear Thinkorswim's business through Bear Stearns because they were a reputable firm, everything. And they said, you know what? We'd love to have your business, but it doesn't look like you can afford to pay us enough money to make it worthwhile come back to us in a couple of years when you grow up. Which is to say that Bear Stearns or any of the giant banks could give a damn about the business. Of course. They want to make sure that you of have course. enough cash in the bank to pay the number. Of course, which at that point, I cursed them. Now it took eight years for them to go out of business, but I gave them the Sosnoff curse and you know they went out of business. The, the, the Sosnoff Sicilian uh, hex? Yes. Yeah, and we went and cleared at a firm that came to us and said, we would love your business. You'll help us grow. We're like, beautiful, let's go. Did you do the same thing to Arthur Anderson, by the way? Was that you? No. No, the only other firm I ever put the hex on, well, there was a couple, but uh, American Express, but they're still in business, and um, uh, Global Crossings, they're out of business. Okay. Oh, I, 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 I personally took Gro Global Crossings down, no question about it. With a combination of the Sosnoff curse, the Sicilian hex, and a voodoo doll? Yes, all, th all three. <laughs>